Hi, I'm Em from 21 Readers. It's time to review Where the Crawdads Sing, comparing the book to the movie. Overall, this was a fairly straightforward adaptation. There weren't any drastic changes to the film from what was in the book. If you liked the book, you'll probably like the film. And if you didn't like the book, you probably won't like the film. That being said, in this video, I'm gonna dive into what worked and didn't work for me in the film, as well as what was the same and different in the film from the book. I first read it in January, 2020, and then I reread it two weeks ago in preparation for the film releasing. This video will contain spoilers from the book and for the movie. First, we have the film elements that work. The cinematography was very strong here. It absolutely elevated the imagery of the marsh. The marsh really did come alive on screen due to the cinematography. We had wide shots, close-up shots, we had various greenery and water scenes, we had different times of day, we had different seasons. The film really did treat the marshland setting as a secondary character. They really went all in with making the cinematography pop and stand out and feel like we were immersed in the North Carolina marshes just like as the reader we felt like we were immersed in the Carolina marshes. The next film element that was a standout for me was the score. I had several moments that I wrote down while watching the film of when the score stood out to me. Parts of the score that stood out to me were the opening shot looking at all of the Carolina marshes, Kaya showing Tate her shack for the first time, Kaya waiting on Tate on the 4th of July, Kaya finding out that Chase is engaged, and when the verdict is released at the end of the court case. Those were all standout moments for me for the score. The score was done by Michael Dana who won an Oscar for best score for Life of Pi, which is another successful book to film adaptation. All right, those are my film elements that stood out to me. Next, I want to talk about the structure of the film and what worked and didn't work for me. I made a wish list video of my expectations going into the book versus the film and I spent a majority of the video talking about the structure and I thought the film did an excellent job improving the structure from how it was done in the book. In the film we immediately see that Chase is dead just like we did in the book and then two officers go to investigate and then they immediately start noticing evidence from the crime scene or lack thereof and then they go into the diner and immediately start hearing townspeople thinking that it's the Marsh girl and then immediately Kaya gets arrested. So the film film did a good job of succinctly wrapping all that into the first five minutes of the film and setting the stage of what we're working with here. Whereas all of that that I just described was drawn out throughout over half of the book of the acquiring evidence, the should we get a warrant, what do the townspeople think, how are we going to get Kaya, all of that was wrapped up right in the first five minutes of the film. And then we immediately go to Kaya in jail and we meet the lawyer, Tom, within the first five minutes of the film. And in the book, Tom is not introduced until 70% of the trial in chapter 38, when the trial begins. So basically they introduced Tom early and Kaya telling Tom her story as the vehicle for which we're gonna flash back into Kaya's childhood, which I think was an excellent idea. So at the beginning of the film, Tom comes to Kaya's cell and saying, I need to get to know you in order to defend you so that you're not found as guilty. So then Kaya ends up telling him her life story. So immediately we flash back to childhood. So the way the film is structured is we have a Kaya flashback and there's Kaya voiceover throughout the flashbacks. And then when that era of her life is over, we go to the present when the trial has now started. So we'll have Kaya childhood, trial, Kaya teenager, trial, Kaya Tate era, trial, Kaya Chase era, trial, Kaya post Chase era, trial. I thought the structuring of the film was a great idea, especially for the pacing, because it wrapped up a section of Kaya's life well, and then we got back to the trial to check in on how that's going. And so it kept it moving. So since it kept it moving, there was never a time that I thought the film dragged for the most part. And I appreciate that the film kept it at the two hour runtime. It could have easily let things drawn out or put more detail into it, bumping it up to two and a half hours. But I thought the two hour runtime was succinct. And I thought it was particularly smart that they used Tom being introduced at the beginning the lawyer for Kaya to communicate to him his story. I do think the ending was rushed with regard to the closing statements of the trial, but I'll get to that when I dive a little bit more into my criticisms of the film at the end of the video. So overall, I think the film succeeded in the pacing and in pulling from the book the main things that needed to stay and cutting out the overflow. All right, moving on to Kaya's characterization, I thought the film did an excellent job of exploring the themes of her loneliness and abandonment themes that were shown throughout the book were shown here. And I thought that that was illustrated well in each of the eras 
that I mentioned in the structure. Like I said, we have the childhood era, teenage era, Tate, Chase, post Chase. So I thought that each of those chunks of the film of Kaya's eras all had the underlying theme of abandonment, being alone, of seeking the Marsha's refuge. Now I'm going to talk about each of those eras, specifically childhood, Tate, and Chase. I'm going to talk about what things worked for me in those sections of the film, as well as what things I noticed were the same and different in the film versus the book. The flashback of Kaya's childhood was pretty much wrapped up between 15 and 20 minutes, whereas in the book we spend a lot longer with her childhood. As much as the childhood chapters were important to the story and in understanding Kaya's upbringing, I am glad that they wrapped it up within 15 to 20 minutes so it didn't feel like we were stuck in the childhood. Immediately we find out from Kaya's childhood about Pa being abusive, and though it might have seemed heavy-handed that he immediately came out being aggressive and abusive, it was basically necessary since we weren't spending that much time in childhood, but we had the same exact themes in the book of Pa being abusive, Ma leaving, and then all the siblings leaving so that Kaya was alone. We had Jody's parting advice to Kaya in the film of going out and hiding out where the crawdads sang if she needs to escape from Pa. When it's just Pa and Kaya, we have the introduction of Jumpin' and Mabel where they go to his wharf, and in the film, Mabel is working with Jumpin' so all their scenes are together. Jumpin' and Mabel are the only caretakers that care for Kaya in the book, and that is the same in the film. And we immediately have Mabel asking Kaya about her schooling, about her ma, and encouraging her to go to school. In the book this was done, the schooling discussion and the making of change was done by other women in the town, but in the film they condensed it to only Mabel. I do think ultimately that the film cutting out some of the random townspeople being critical of Kaya ended up hurting the film's effectiveness in terms of conveying the divide of the townspeople versus Kaya, but I was glad to see Mabel and Jumpin' in it more. Something new in the childhood section is young Tate being in it. So in the film we see young Tate on his boat and Tate comes to Kaya's defense when he sees Pa hurting Kaya, which was not in the book. It's only alluded to in the book that Tate knew Kaya because Tate was friends with Jody as kids, but we actually see it on screen in the film which I thought was a great choice in order to convey that Tate was being protective over Kaya. And Tate's kind of goofy and a little bit oafish as a kid and that also translates to his personality once he's a teenager so I thought that it was important that they had that in there. In the film we still had that powerful scene where Ma writes a letter and Pa burns it but then Kaya keeps the ashes in a bottle which is basically the start of her collection and I'm glad they kept it in. Something that was different in the film is that Pa burned all of Ma's things before he left. Another thing that was different in the film is that after Pa leaves Kaya goes and moves her bed out by the window so that she can feel like she's more in nature with what she hears and sees and I thought that was a great touch to show that Kaya is being one with nature now and embracing it even more now that she's alone and it's all that she has. They also kept Kaya going to school for one day only in the film and something that was of note is that on the way to school young Kaya runs into Tom the person that's going to eventually be her lawyer and that was not in the film. Next we have the teenage era and the Tate era. A lot of the things were the same with Tate and Kaya meeting up, with Tate teaching her how to read, with Tate being vulnerable about how he lost his mom and sister, and we had the scene where they kissed with the leaves blowing and it was just as cheesy in the film as it was in the book. Something I noticed that was a tad different in the film is that when Kaya and Tate were together and Kaya was trying to hide in the marsh away from social services, I noticed Kaya trying to hide her tracks with the leaves and the brush, so I thought that was a smart way to kind of sneak in there that Kaya has gotten better at navigating her surroundings and navigating the marsh and also foreshadowing that she would be able to do similar things with hiding her tracks when she eventually kills Chase. Other things that were the same here from the book and the movie are Tate encouraging Kaya to publish her work as well as Tate abandoning Kaya to go to college and not coming back on the 4th of July like he promised. So this brings us to the halfway point of the film where Tate doesn't come back on the 4th of July and here we have another instance of Kaya being abandoned just like her family abandoned her, her first love of Tate abandoned her. All right, moving on to Chase. When I made my previous video about what to expect for the book versus the film, one of my questions was, is the audience going to hate Chase from the beginning? And the answer to that is yes, because something new for the film that was not in the book was that they gave Chase a harmonica to play on their picnic date, which immediately made the audience think he was insufferable. And he played it not once, but twice. <laughs> So that was new in the film, the harmonica playing, it wasn't in the book. But other blatant things Chase did that made the audience hate him was calling her the marsh girl to her face 
and going past her boundaries both physically and just inviting himself into the shack into her safe haven with her collection and just dismissing her knowledge of wildlife so immediately the audience is not on board with chase at all i took note here that the chase scenes were a particularly good use of the Kaya voiceover in present day because she talked about how she felt conflicted about her feelings with Chase, but she knew that she didn't like being alone. So I felt that that was an effective way of convincing you why Kaya was staying with Chase and dealing with Chase, even though we knew that Kaya didn't really like him and we as the audience definitely didn't like him. Getting into some more differences with Chase is that Kaya finds out in person that Chase is engaged in the film, whereas in the book she found out via the newspaper. Another thing is that after the assault scene when Kaya is hiding from Chase, Chase goes into the shack and ransacks all her things which was not in the book. Another thing that was in the film that was not in the book is that there is an explicit scene of Kaya explaining to Jumpin why she's not going to report Chase for what he did, including that of the fact that the town wouldn't believe the Marsh girl and that was explicitly in the film and not in the book. The film did an effective job at portraying Kaya living in fear after the assault such as her hiding in the boat, her being hyper vigilant at every minute, move at every sound and it really conveyed in a short amount of time how fearful and desperate Kaya was after the assault. Moving into more things from the film that were same and different, for different, one of the biggest differences of plot points involved Tate and Chase and that is one, in the film Tate had the red hat and Tate and Chase get into it and some punches were thrown and so this whole scene was new of Tate confronting Chase saying to back off of Kaya and the red fibers from the hat Tate was wearing could have gotten on Chase in that scene and later in the scene where Kaya throws rocks at Tate, Tate gives Kaya the hat so that is putting the seed of doubt in the audience's head that hmm is Tate the one that killed Chase because the whole red fiber thing and then they double down on that putting a seed of doubt that Tate's the one that did it later in the film because during the closing arguments the closing statements of the trial we have the prosecutor mentioning that Kai is the only person that could have had a motive to kill Chase and while that's being verbally said we cut to a scene in the past of Tom the defense lawyer seeing Tate in town so basically showing that Tom might be thinking hmm maybe Tate's the one that did it so that is how the film portrayed that Tate is the one that could have killed Chase, which is different from the book because in the book, none of that happened with the Tate Chase scene and with Tom thinking it was Tate. Instead, that was conveyed by Tate getting pulled into a police boat so that the police could tell him that his dad died. But in the film, Tate's dad doesn't die and Tate doesn't go in the police boat. So that's how the film conveyed that maybe Tate's the one that killed Chase and they did it very differently than the book. Some other differences in the film from the book is that Amanda Hamilton was completely cut out of the film. There are poems throughout the book from a poet named Amanda Hamilton that are interspersed throughout the book and at the end of the book we found out that Kaya was Amanda Hamilton all along. That whole storyline of Amanda Hamilton was not even mentioned in the film. Another thing that was the same but slightly different in its approach was the process of Kaya getting published and Kaya obtaining her deed for the house and for the property. In the film we had Tate giving Kaya an idea to publish and Kaya kind of dismissing the idea but then developers come and take pictures of the land and jump in and Mabel encourage Kaya to get official documentation so that she has the land. So once Kaya gets the information of how much money it would cost for her to obtain the legal documents, that's what pushes Kaya to become published. So in the film it was very much Kaya actively pursuing the legal documentation and then as a result of wanting to pursue the documentation, then she goes and pursues being published. In the book, Kaya had already published two guidebooks before the developers came to take pictures, and then Kaya just quickly got the deeds together. So the timeline was a little bit different, and the order was a little different. And then another plot point that was still in the film, just like it was in the book, was Kaya's brother Jody coming back to visit once he sees her book being published. And the main function of Jody coming back is to tell Kaya that their mom had died and that she had tried to contact them and get custody but it didn't work out due to her illness and due to Pa being threatening. So that was the extent to which Jody was in the film. Not very much, just like he wasn't in the book very much. One thing though is in the book Jody encourages Kaya to give Tate another chance but in the film Jody doesn't even bring up Tate. All right now that we've talked about what's the same and different in the book and the film I want to move into my criticisms of the film. My first is that the individual performances were just fine. I didn't feel particularly compelled by any individual performance. Walking out of the theater, I felt compelled by the story as a whole, but there wasn't a particular performance where I was like, 
that was a great performance or I'm gonna remember that performance. It was the story that I felt connected to and that I'll remember. I was definitely thinking some of the actors could elevate the characters and make me think, oh, they were a standout, but really nobody was a standout. The next criticism I have is the closing statements of the trial were rushed. For example, some of the witnesses from the book were taken out and so the prosecutor and the defense lawyer had to kind of mention those witnesses and those pieces of evidence in their closing statements to kind of tie everything up into a nice little bow. The witnesses that were taken out of the film were both of the bus drivers that may or may not have seen Kaya in disguise and the hotel clerk that may or may not have seen Kaya sneaking out to get on the later bus. So basically in the closing statements we had to summarize the far-fetched theory that Kaya put on a disguise, took the late bus back to Berkeley Cove, killed Chase, and got back to Greenville by the next bus. And so this was all explained very quickly with no extra visuals or flashbacks from the closing statements. And in my head, I was thinking if I was seeing the film having not read the book, would I be confused right now? Because I knew what was going on having read the book twice and knew what they were talking about because it is very drawn out in the book. It seems like they're springing this theory on all of a sudden in the film, whereas in the book, we knew this was coming. So that was a little bit of a problem with the pacing for me. However, I do get that we wanted to get to the point and get to the not guilty verdict so we can move on with our lives but also I feel like it could have been confusing for people that hadn't read the book as to their theory about Kaya getting the early bus back. So pacing wise I enjoyed the pacing of the film but the biggest flaw with the pacing was the closing statement section of the trial. Another criticism I have for the film is the relationship that Kaya had with the townspeople was not explored very much. The relationship of Kaya and the townspeople kind of took a back seat in order to prioritize Kaya's relationship with her parents, with Chase, with Tate, with Mabel and Jumpin. And I think that really affected the emotional moment when she's eventually found not guilty. Because in the book, the defense lawyer is really reaching out to the jurors, to the townspeople saying, you have shunned her, called her the marsh girl. Here's your opportunity to right your wrongs, to ask for forgiveness of how you treated her. And that sentiment is still in the film. However, the emotional moment when she's eventually found not guilty didn't really feel earned because in the film it didn't really spend enough time showing that Taya was being ostracized by the town. In the book, it's more emotional because it's a turning point for the town, but in the film, when Kaya is found not guilty, it's more just emotional because yay, Kaya is getting out of jail. I don't really feel any connection to the fact that the town people are now forgiving her, trying to turn over a new leaf. Like for example, the thing I said before about Mabel being the one to ask her about her schooling, to ask her about her parents, made sense because we had to get through a lot of content in a little bit of time. But all of those corners that were cut of townspeople not interacting with Kaya throughout the film ended up harming the eventual emotional impact that them providing a not guilty verdict could have shown. So the townspeople versus Kaya element was very much lost here in the film. Even at the beginning of the film, Tom asks Kaya in their first interaction, do you even know that you're called the Marsh Girl? That's how much there is of a disconnect of us as the viewer getting to see Kaya's relationship with the town. I get why they prioritize Kaya's relationships with the other people, not so much the townspeople, but I think that it got muddled down and lost the effectiveness there for the not guilty verdict. So those are my biggest three criticisms of the film. All right, moving into the ending. The ending was my favorite part of the book, so I had high expectations for the ending going into the film. I was hoping it would give me chills, and yep, the movie ending totally did. The film ending was very similar to the book ending, almost the exact same, beat by beat. There were some slight differences though. Here's the film ending. We have the not guilty verdict. We have Kai and Tate getting back together. We have a montage of them growing old together in the marsh. Then we show a passage of time by Jumpin putting out a new book in his window. Then we have Jody visiting with his kids then we have jump in's death then we have something that was different from the book is this cinematic moment old kaya who's now in her 60s is on the boat in the marsh and she sees has a vision of her ma coming back and when there's emotional music playing and then we cut to childhood kaya and then we cut to adulthood kaya back to in her 60s kaya leading up to kaya's death it was a very cinematic moment and i ended up tearing up so it was definitely effective with kaya's death kaya dies in the boat after the emotional montage moment and Tate finds her and then we cut to Tate going through Kaya's things 
packing it up to get sent to the UNC lab for research, we're assuming. And then Tate's looking through one of Kaya's journals with the sketches. And first we have the praying mantis picture with the foreshadowing line about female praying mantises needing to kill their mate if they need to survive in nature. And then we have the next sketch, which is of Chase with the shell necklace in order to remind the viewers about the shell necklace. And then in the very back cover carved into the back cover is the shell necklace. So I got chills just like I did when I was reading the book of Tate finding the shell necklace. And then Tate puts the shell back in the sand in the ocean. And then the final shot is of the dark marsh with fireflies and Kaya doing a voiceover. And it has the ending of the same line as the book, which is way out yonder where the crawdads sing. So I was definitely satisfied with the ending. I'm glad they didn't make any tweaks to it because I was very satisfied with the book ending and the film ending was pretty much the same. The only thing that was different was one, we had that cinematic death. And then in the book, Tate found the shell necklace in the floorboards, whereas in the film, he found it in the sketchbook, which I thought was smart that they included the praying mantis foreshadowing and the picture of Chase so that they could remind us about the shell necklace. And the shell necklace reveal, of course, is us finding out that Kaya did in fact kill Chase. The shell necklace is brought up very frequently in the book, so we didn't need any type of reminder when we were reading, but in the film, the shell necklace is only touched upon in the Chase era of the film. So it made sense we needed a little bit of reminder there so that the ending could still hit. Next, I'm going to talk about who would I recommend this movie to. If you liked the book, I would recommend the movie. If you didn't like the book, I don't think you would like the movie. If the book wasn't your thing, then the film probably won't be your thing either. If you've seen the film but you haven't read the book, I would recommend the book to you if you want to learn more about Kaya's childhood, the exploration of themes of abandonment and loneliness, more imagery from the marsh and the wildlife, more exploration of how Kaya was treated in the town, and just an overall deeper dive into Kaya's psyche. I could see this film being a safe choice come Thanksgiving time when you have like adult children coming home to their parents' house and you're trying to find a safe option. This is a pretty safe option to turn on at a family gathering. Nothing too heavy, it's a tearjerker, it's not too long, and if you have some people watching that have read the book, you all can discuss your own thoughts on how the book compares to the movie. Tell me in the comments your thoughts on how the movie compared to the book and I'll see you in the next one. Bye!